Once again, the, the hits just keep on coming with our panel today. To the next speaker is Felicia Marcus. Um, she was appointed by Governor Jerry Brown to the State Water Resources Control Board for the state of California in 2012 and designated by the governor as chair in April 2013. Um, for those who are not all that familiar with the board, the board implements both federal st and state laws regarding drinking water and water quality and its implication implements the state's water rights laws. The board sets statewide water quality, drinking water and water rights policy, hears appeals of local regional water um, quality decisions, decides water rights disputes, and provides financial assistance to communities to upgrade water infrastructure. Before her appointment at the Water Board, uh, Felicia was um, served in positions in, in government, the nonprofit world, and the private sector. In government, she served as the regional administrator of the US EPA Region 9 in the Clinton administration, where she was known for her work in bringing unlikely allies um, together for environmental progress and making the agency more responsive to the communities they serve, particularly Indian tribes, communities of color, local government, and agricultural business interest. Prior to that, Felicia headed the Los Angeles Department of Public Works. Um, she came to Public Works after extensive experience as a public interest lawyer and community organizer in Los Angeles, including being a co-founder and general counsel for Hill the Bay. In the nonprofit world, she was Western Director for the Natural Resource Defense Council. Prior to joining NRDC, Felicia was the Executive VP, COO of the Trust for Public Lands. She also was a private and nonprofit sector attorney in Los Angeles. So you can see she has not been very busy. <laughs> so it's uh, a, a great pleasure to introduce Felicia Marcus. to deal with the elephant in the room, because otherwise you won't hear a word that I have to say. I know that is not a salmon. <laughs> but I do want to tell you that finding appealing pictures of a talking salmon ate up at least two hours of my time. <laughs> over the course of the last few weeks. And so my plea to you before I begin my talk this morning is please send me your best pictures of salmon who look like they're talking. <laughs> I found a good one this morning, and then of course I read the tag on the image, and it was a, a dead smolt that had been found you know, after floodwaters receded. So I didn't use it because it was just too painful, and I knew that the rest of you would know that it was a dead smolt. Um, <laughs> But I have to say, okay, it's a striped bass. I'll admit it, big mouth billy bass, to be sure. And if all of you don't already have one of these, it either means you're a lot younger than I am, or you don't have a sense of humor. Because this, this was one of the best things that ever came out on the Christmas gift uh, market. Um, and I, as I said, I, I do, my goal is to find someone techy enough to be able to get into its innards and change the words so I can have it say whatever I want when someone goes by. But if a salmon could talk, they would probably say, kill this guy, you know, as often as you can. So I found another talking fish. What this particular fish, as you know, would say, keep that cat out of my house. Any event, then if you haven't, you either don't have kids or you don't remember the cat in the hat. Um, but it was a more charming talking fish. So with that, let me start my talk. Um, I have to say that it, it fills my heart, and I anticipated it filling my heart, to see so many people who are working on restoration activities uh, in one place. I spent a lot of my time in the word arena, which is sometimes more like the Roman arena of old, more than even a sporting event. And as you heard, I've had a lot of jobs both in government and in the private sector and the nonprofit world. I've done advocacy, policy making, and management. I've been in regulatory agencies and in operations agencies, and in the nonprofit world, I've been in advocacy and in project delivery uh, organizations, a trust for public land. At the national level, I got to see 200 plus miracles a year of people restoring a place together with people that they never thought they'd be able to agree on lunch with. So I've been through the world uh, and had a, a taste of what you deal with every day. And I have to say it's been a good run and I've learned a lot, met a lot of great people, and I hope done some good work along the way. 
But I have to say there is something really wonderful about working and being with people who are trying to get stuff done on the ground, whether land conservation, organizing the public to pick up trash, restoring a wetland, or just teaching a child about the wonder of the world around them. Uh, public Works was my biggest and hardest job like that. TPL, neck and neck with that, with Heal the Bay and other local LA groups being my formative experiences. There's something about being grounded in trying to change something real, whether it's restoring a salmon stream, fixing a sewage system, filling a pothole. If you've never filled a pothole, it's a rush, I just have to say. <laughs> um, or making sure that the trash gets picked up and recycling goes long, which is what we did in LA, that's just different. Those jobs are the hardest and potentially the most rewarding, but they also draw people to them who have a combination of vision and heart and connection to something bigger than they are. So thank you for the work that you're trying to do, which is challenging but essential, frustrating but noble, and important to so many of us, whether we have scientific skill or not, wear waders and fleece or not, work outdoors or always behind a desk, or can even say fluvial geomorphology. <laughs> so I thought I'd start with a couple of quotes, one in particular, maybe just one. You know, one is, it's a quote from Aldo Leopold that we used to really love and use a lot at TPL, but I think of all the time. One of the anomalies of modern ecology is the creation of two groups, each of which seems barely aware of the existence of the other. The one studies the human community, almost as if it were a separate entity, and calls its findings sociology, economics, and history. The other studies the plant and animal community and comfortably relegates the hodgepodge of politics to the liberal arts. The inevitable fusion of these two lines of thought will, perhaps, constitute the outstanding advance of this century. That's what interests me most in some ways about this work, not the, the line of specialization, but drawing together the notion of the natural world and people and the fact that we are intrinsically connected and trying to find those connections and draw in more allies to the restorative work of restoring say, salmon streams and salmon runs for the value to the salmon, but more than that, the value to ourselves individually and as a people. So the title I chose was If Salmon Could Talk Instinctively, in part because it'd be a lot easier for us if they could. Um, and because so many people purport to talk for them on both sides of the water battles. And it feels sometimes to me, frankly, like sometimes people are so focused telling each other why they're wrong that they forget to focus on the fish. And I have this vision of a fish just saying, excuse me, excuse me, um, as we're seeing the rhetorical battles about what they need. So I was really happy to come here to thank you because you keep your eye on the ball, which is the fish, actually. I just thought he was cute. Or is it a she? I don't know. Maybe you do. So Jay did a great job. So um, I, I'm going to flash through uh, way too many slides. And uh, forgive me if I glance over them. But I had, I had a lot I wanted to say. But I really only have a few things I wanted to leave you with this morning, for starters. And I know we'll have a chance to have more conversations now and for the future. And so I'm going to talk a bit about the California water context, but Jay did a great job and did a lot of it. Um, and the other Jay will talk about the rest of it. So the Jay's a, uh, I'm a Jay sandwich. No. <laughs> You're a Felicia sandwich. No, I don't know. Sorry, I'm from, from LA. I, you know, forgive me. Um, <laughs> from the valley. Like, really. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about, I'm every woman. That's who I am. <laughs> So, I mean, how many of you was Jay's Borg slide the best picture in the whole thing, right? Of course. So I'll talk about Bay Delta, but I cannot talk about California water fix. And I will just say that that has been the issue that has sucked all the air out of the room about Bay Delta issues for a long time. I spend months in the room uh, in a water rights hearing, so I cannot talk about it. I can, I can tell you context-wise. I can't talk about it. I can't hear about it. I have to run out of the room when it comes up. Uh, it's sort of, I keep saying that California water fix is the new by Felicia, because I got to leave the room. <laughs> if it gets um, mentioned, go to a party, lean against the refrigerator, somebody walks through and says about that water fix, and I got to leave. 
And then I'll talk a little bit about the talking salmon. So forgive me as I roll through. Well, I had a lot I was going to say about California water policy. Um, and Jay said m most of it. But I, I always, as those of you who know me know, I always start with an elephant. And you would say, why an elephant and not a salmon or a salmonid of some kind? And it's because when we're trying to deal with California water policy, which I dealt with very intensively through the Bay Delta Accord and other years, and then ran screaming out of the water world because I was so tired of being the princess of peace all of the time. And I like to say it's hard to be the princess of peace when you're pissed. But I was tired <laughs> of how often I had to get the warring parties to sit down and try and focus on the fish, for example or to see where they had won a war but had to give up a battle because they had to give something up to folks because that's the way we move forward as a society with competing um, interests. And I left and I went to land conservation because I wanted to work with folks who knew how to make a deal. I wanted to work with folks who worked on tangible things on the ground with people, a focus on the thing versus at the other people or out in some intellectual uh, ozone, and it was, it was a restorative experience for me. And when I came back into the water world, got dragged back into it um, when I uh, moved back in the policy world at NRDC and got dragged into the 09 um, legislation negotiations, because I'm not so good or that smart, but apparently people do behave better when I'm in the room, because I just listen to all of them. So we have a long way to go in our world. There, there are a lot of people who do it too, but um, uh, I, was, I guess I was kind of happy to be drawn back in, but one thing that I noticed was it was the same people saying the same things past each other across the decades. And I also noticed, because I was a little older and more mature, that you had people who were really smart and knew a lot, whether it was about fish or conveyance systems or dams or farming or you name it, and they knew it all very deeply, and they knew one piece of the water pie and they would say, just this one thing will solve it all, which of course isn't true. And not recognizing that portfolio that uh, Jay was talking about, which is the way you actually solve things, or the portfolio of things that we see in nature in an ecosystem, as opposed to pulling out um, single species or the like. And it reminded me of that parable of the blind men and the elephant who are each touching a different part of this magical creature and describing something completely different. And I, 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 I <laughs> there are a whole herd of elephants in most um, policy rooms about uh, uh, water, but that I, saw, I always see that as part of the problem with moving forward on solutions that a regular person, my Aunt Charlotte, my friends, your friends, would expect us to have conversations about in solving problems. And so unless you deal with this weird log jam, whether you call it the elephant in the room or the elephant phenomenon or the, the, the inability to see how other people see things, uh, we're not going to make as much progress as we need to. And those of you in the room who know me for a long time and most of you don't know that I'm, I'm fond of saying that the biggest challenge before us isn't scientific, technical, engineering, economic, legal, you name it, uh, even the complexity of ecosystem management, it is the challenge of ecosystem management. And that does not mean big egos. That means being able to actually see the people in the room that you need to get together with to actually do things uh, on the ground. So I'll talk a little bit about that, and that is my, more of my focus. So Jay did this. I'll just put an exclamation point on the climate change uh, issue where uh, with a few degrees temperature rise, we lose a lot of or uh, all of our snowpack over the next decades to come. Uh, for anyone who's been working in this field, if you see the water and the snowpack up north being uh, you know, a third of our storage in an average year in a state that relies on storage above ground or below, and, or below but where it doesn't rain and snow every year, it doesn't rain and snow in the places where it's most used and that we've come to rely on it, uh, not in the time of year. Uh, storage becomes very important. Uh, that's why the emphasis on groundwater management, because those basins are the only thing that can approximate in size the snowpack that we're going to lose. And if we don't get off our duffs and start taking a different approach to water and doing a lot of things, uh, all of the conflicts we see today are going to seem like a picnic 
compared to what's to come when we're going to be losing that. So this is the picture on the bathroom mirror every day to motivate me to get things in motion. For the administration, oh darn, I thought I made that faster, I apologize. We have taken a portfolio approach and I'm not going to go through everything in the water action plan, but I give it to you for the context that, uh, of what our administration's been trying to do relentlessly for the past uh, few years. And it came out uh, uh, a year before the end of the last uh, term and it was our five year promise uh, to everyone that these were the things we were gonna focus on for the next five years to lay a foundation for a more sustainable water future. It's an all of the above strategy, it is a portfolio strategy it is all and also let's get off our butts and stop talking and start doing strategy I, I, come with me if you want to live we are in motion <laughs> trying to do all these do we do every single one of these things everywhere but we've got to do them where they're appropriate and where they go and i just wanted to highlight too i mean i generally highlight providing safe water for all communities because i actually think that is the top issue of our time and our top uh priority because it has to be with so many Californians not having clean, safe, and affordable water. But right up there, uh, achieving those co-equal goals for the Delta, um, you know, because it is the vortex of so many things, ecosystem, water supply, the people there, it, 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 any number of things, and it's uh, a challenging system that we need to deal with. Uh, but I also want to point out pr protecting and restoring important ecosystems, which is getting ahead of the curve, not waiting until something's endangered and trying to take that single species approach, but trying to do, go long on restoration. Again, the drought has delayed a lot of what we were doing, but many of you are no doubt engaged in the work that we're doing, both on the North Coast, salmon streams and elsewhere to try and make some headway. The work that Chuck Bonham and others have tried to do, starting to have a conversation about upper watershed work, mountain meadow, uh, restoration um, and the like. There's a lot, a lot going on there, and I invite you to work with us on that, with Cal Eco Restore and all the money that was in the bond that Chuck has and others have to spend. Uh, we can make a little dent, but uh, it's just a down payment on what we need to do. There's more to it. Where'd that go? Oh, so now it's doing both. Thanks. A lot. What are you doing? This I can't blame the machine on. This is me too late last night trying to make it go faster. That didn't work. So, um, so we've talked about the drought a little bit. I won't, I won't go into too much detail just in the interest of time. This was the slide that broke our hearts, of course. Um, this was the worst snowpack in modern history um, from April of 2015 that set in motion much more dramatic uh, actions on our part and um, caused incredible amount of devastation it, it, with all the caveats that Jay mentioned. It is extraordinary that we came through this as well as we did with all um, sensitivity to people who were hurt and there were a lot of people who were hurt. But I do have to put my happy slide up um, and it is just my happy slide to make you a little happier. Um, but I, I have to say we can't be totally happy yet because flooding can cause mayhem, death, and destruction. And so, as I've been explaining to people, they say, are you just thrilled and happy that it's rained and snowed? And all I can say is I'm getting a little more sleep. I owe, I owe Bill Croyle a really good bottle of scotch because um, he doesn't get to relax at all. But I'm containing my euphoria until we really are out of the woods in the flood risk season. And I have been saying we want all the rain and snow we can safely handle for the last four years because I don't want to be the one who asked for all the rain and snow in the world and caused that death and destruction. Is that like a wonky way to live? I can't have to contain my euphoria. So sometime mid-June, I'm told, we'll have a party and you'll see me dancing on stage, which could be the first time that ever happens. So Jay talked about a lot of the impacts and obviously the fish and wildlife ones were huge. The communities out of water were huge. The fallowed fields and people out of work um, could have been a lot worse, but was really pretty, pretty darn terrible. We did a lot of things. I won't go through um, all of them now. Some of them were really good and I will um, talk. I did, my notes do say on water rights, we went beyond where anyone has gone before. Um, that was for Jay. Uh, but I will say that we, we made some decisions, and this is one of the things I did want to say here and I've said elsewhere, 
uh, where because we were seeing such an unprecedented confluence of challenges and we were looking at what was left in the project's storage and trying to figure out how to balance and maintain salinity control in the delta so that we didn't lose it and therefore make the water unusable for who knew how long for um, people or farming in the delta or south of the delta. Um, we didn't know how we were gonna deal with both spring flows uh, as salmon were trying, to, I'm oversimplifying of course, salmon trying to get out, but trying to hold enough water for temperature and um, largely temperature control. Um, through the fall, um, we cut it a little too close. I mean, I, I want to, uh, my hat's off to the fish agencies who did the heavy lifting of working with the projects to try and come up with what they thought might work. Uh, both sides have a lot of uh, arrows in their back from the, their uh, respective uh, constituency groups. We at the water board are kind of uh, in the middle because we're supposed to balance that we do obviously have a thumb on the scale um, for fish and wildlife and environmental issues. Um, and, uh, and I think folks did a good job of trying really hard, but far better than in any time I had seen before, certainly better than the 90s, um, but we missed it on temperature control a couple of years and we lost uh, an awful lot of uh, salmon eggs and I will take that one to my grave. Uh, as something that I really wish we had been more conservative that second year. But I, I do want to say on behalf of the folks who, who worked so hard to try and make it work, it wasn't for lack of caring about the fish. It was for making some really hard choices that are really easy for people who don't have to make those choices to think they could have made better because you do have to own all those competing interests and what's happening. I can say that to a lot of people, but that, that was one of the things I wanted to say. Um, we also got that water bond passed, which isn't uh, the end of the story, but certainly a good beginning. And the money in there for ecological restoration is really, really important. And as I understand it, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard from Chuck and others, um, it, it is, uh, whether you call it Project Eco Restore or just the other projects that they've been able to get more done in the past couple of years than the past 20, because we've sort of unleashed uh, folks into trying to actually focus on let's get projects done on the ground and hopefully there'll be many, many, many more and hopefully many of you are getting more funding uh, on projects that you uh, care about. So that, that's pretty important. There's more there, but I'll keep going. Now, people think I'm fixated on this slide and some of you have seen this. I am not doing a whole talk about beer this morning because we're talking about fish, but I love this quote, you know, uh, because so many people can be patronizing about people. Uh, but really about the value of real facts and about how people, if given the right facts, uh, the real facts can uh, rise to the occasion, and they certainly did during the drought. And then I love this thing about the great point is to bring them the real facts and beer. And as many of you know, I won't go through it all, I did a lot of Googling late night on that one and, um, and you know, looked for quotes about beer. I mean, you have the Ben Franklin ones but uh, many of them uh, reportedly by him. But I looked up Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan and beer, and I got nothing, I just wanna say, <laughs> nothing that was really good. Um, I did get from Martin Luther, the original that popped up, whoever drinks beer, he is quick to sleep long. <laughs> does not sin. Whoever does not sin, enters heaven. Thus, let us drink beer, <laughs> which I thought was really pretty good. So this morning I actually tried uh, Googling um, Abe Lincoln. You may think I just have too much free time. This is just my, re I could be playing video games, you know. Um, I tried Abe Lincoln and Salmon. I thought, hey, he might have gotten something good there. I got zip, but I didn't spend that much time on it. But I did get this. I have simply tried to do what seemed best each day as each day came. I decided those were words to live by, even if I can't put a fish in the picture. So what's the reality we're dealing with? And Jay talked about a lot of this. That loss of snowpack is the biggest one. Sea level's gonna rise. What does that mean? People right now are using that as a weapon, depending on who they are. It's something we have to deal with. And restoration, particularly in the Delta, is one of the key things that can help deal with it. Many of you know that. The Delta needs our help. The ecosystem, the people in it, and the people dependent on it. 
So we've got to get off our butts and figure out how to, how to not break the Gordian knot, but make some real uh, improvement there. Here's the reality that makes it hard to sleep at night, which is all the people uh, in this state who rely on wells that are contaminated. If you're in, these aren't all the ones who rely on wells. If you're in a large urban area, as, as Jay's slides talked about, you can afford to treat it, blend it, et cetera. If you're in a small rural urban community relying on shallow groundwater wells, uh, you cannot. And even under the, the um, systems that we regulate, which is small systems over 25, um, we know there are you know hundreds of communities that can't, just can't meet uh, modern treatment standards. And we're making headway, we've got money on it, we've gotten authority to consolidate, we've gotten all kinds of tools from the legislature, but we still, the big thing to watch for this year is can we get an operation and maintenance funding source, because they will never be able to afford even to keep a system running, even if we build it. And this is the issue of our time for Californians. I think Californians, if you give them this information, will absolutely contribute a few bucks a year or a month so that people can have clean, safe, and affordable drinking water. So let's hope they get that chance. Population's gonna rise, our infrastructure, it, it's actually, the issue is more a lot of little problems rather than the big one, but it's such a good picture. Um, this is one that California agriculture, it painted as a demon by many who are advocates for salmon, and I think that's short-sighted, um, is also a precious resource for all of us, only, only five Mediterranean climates in the world that can grow the level of healthy fruits and vegetables, we can. Now, there are, I need better slides on this, please. I, I just did an invitation for my slide deck. I was just trying to pull things out. It just looks bad if I go really fast. You can see it looks really bad, but it's still not the best uh, set of slides, but that is critically important and uh, massively. Oops. Jay's gonna talk about this really well, but it's a great picture. And really, more importantly, the reality is there's a lot we can do through integrated water management, the portfolio approach that Jay talked about, which is part of why we're pushing so hard to figure out how to move forward versus being stuck on it. It's this one thing. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Is so. Is not. You're a jerk. No, I'm not. That's the level of discourse we have a lot of the time. That is not going to get us where we need to go. And the reality is there's a lot of good, I know there are a lot of words on this slide, but as every time I look at it, there's more going on. I mean, as you see, Concentrated recycling, we got a billion dollars out the door in low cost grants and loans to get stuff off the drawing board and onto into the ground. I got three billion backed up in requests, far more than we can ever spend. It's exciting what people want to do. Conservation, what the urban public did when finally given the information was hitting it out of the park. They've learned that they don't need to hemorrhage water on their lawns. When people put out, when agencies put out rebates, they got snapped up in weeks. People are transitioning to drought tolerant if they can afford it. Um, I think people are good and people wanna try and do the right thing. But again, remember I, I rolled out a recycling program. That one made a lot less sense uh, dealing with it with water, it made sense. But it was driven by a public sensibility that they didn't wanna waste and they wanted to be part of a solution. So my bias is I do believe in the public and they'll rise to the occasion. You also had farmers in the Delta agreeing to, senior water rights holders in the Delta agreeing to take 25% less water. Why? Well, then they knew they could bring in 75% crop in a curtailment. But if you read all of the stories and you read the reason why, they also didn't want to be seen as part of the problem. They did not want to be seen as we're senior, you can't touch us, when fish and wildlife and people uh, were hurt. And that has never happened before at that scale and was pretty exciting. And of course you had a lot of the fish farmer win-wins, you all are a part of them, where folks have tried, rice has an awful lot of them, but they're not the only place, and drought angels helping each other, et cetera, but a lot. And the groundwater management movement, which uh, Jay will talk about a bit, which is underway, again, slower than some would like, but a really heavy lift. There are a lot of great things happening, let me just say that, because those were a bunch of Debbie Downer slides. I'm not gonna go through this, just except to give you a sense that we're busy. And overall, the goal is to implement that water action plan. You know, come with me. If you, we're going, so come with us. Give me a better way, but don't stand on ceremony and just say it's one thing. It's not one thing. It's a lot of things. So there's a lot here. And I put cannabis curve at the bottom, as many of you know, because it is the tsunami of pain uh, coming our way. It already is a lot of pain, and we've been able to get resources to deal with it, um, but uh, we'll see if the approach 
um, that the legislation, which gave us a lot more authority, quicker to set in stream flows and do a number of things, uh, if it'll get us where we need to go. And I know a lot of you are on the front lines of that. That's a huge thing that we're dealing with. The Bay Delta Plan, you hear um, a lot about. I, I use this one because it actually shows uh, those rivers. As you know, what we need to do, and this, this is the most fraught, biggest deal, highest stakes politics uh, we deal with, where we have to update the Bay Delta Plan. Last was done 21 years ago. 21 years ago. Uh, it didn't work out as planned. I mean, it did some good, but it didn't work out as planned as people diverted at different times of year and different things happened. Uh, you know, more than 10 years ago, the board identified the need for the update, um, and we've been working hard on it. A lot of it was delayed for a full three years as all the same people were working on the drought, and then we got some more staff to get it going. And I won't get into all the detail because some of you know, but it's tough. Uh, it, one of the key things we're doing is focusing up the TRIBS. The old plan ended up being it, implemented by a, a settlement where the projects took on all the responsibility down sort of at the confluence of all of the TRIBS. And we certainly, this isn't why we did it this way, we certainly found during the drought that the projects alone don't have the capacity to deal with all the issues um, that are there, but we moved up the tributaries because the fish live and live their lives and the critical parts of their life cycle up the tributaries. But that has brought in a whole host of more serious uh, opposition as they see uh, uh, the need to, that there'll be a need to contribute where they are. The idea is an idea of unimpaired flow. People have taken those words and twisted them and said they mean all kinds of different things so they can punch it uh, as a punching bag. Uh, the whole notion of that is a different way to uh, approximate flow. Right now we do it by calendar date based on how, how wet it was sort of the week uh, before where you have these stair steps. Those were the things we had to relax um, uh, or felt we had to relax during the um, drought, which was an unprecedented use of the temporary urgency change uh, orders. But this whole idea is to use unimpaired flow as an approximation of nature, as a way to just at least share the river with fish and wildlife. In many of these uh, areas, 80 or 90 percent of the water is diverted out at many times. Well, fish and wildlife can't survive that. Regular pe people understand that. They, people had no idea that we're diverting that much out of the river. Even if you know the dry San Joaquin, part of middle of the San Joaquin, there's a lot more that runs dry or nearly dry. And you, again, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. But we knew that that alone wasn't the perfect thing. It'll simulate the cues in nature that fish have evolved for. But our whole idea, and a key part of it, was this olive branch isn't really the right word, but this awareness that humans coming together with fisheries agencies, farmers, irrigation districts, um, you, you know, some reasonable group of stakeholders coming together and deciding how to shape those flows in an adaptive management framework, trying something one year and something else the next, coming up with biological objectives, keeping their eye on the fish, are going to have a different dynamic and a different human energy brought to this that might actually get us a lot further than just a piece of paper that says a percentage with enforcement. Um, it, it's been taken that we want that sort of s standard unimpaired flow, that that's the answer. No, that's kind of the backstop. But it's really a way to approximate how you could help the fish best with an offer to come together and maybe get some discount on the amount of water if you do all those other non-flow things that we also know that fish need. And this is important because obviously, you know, flow is essential to fish. Um, you don't need to have a fish talk to know that, but, um, but other things are too. And so figuring out how we can uh, create a circumstance where we leverage that great human energy around trying to solve a problem is really important to us. And I will just say without telling a lot of stories, I mean, I'm, I'm getting older now, and I am a veteran of the sewage turnaround uh, in LA, but it really the constructing the conditions under which people came together changes the dynamic of how they talk and did uh, probably the biggest environmental turnaround in the country in that decade. And it was all because of the individual people in the room who stopped fighting and talking past each other and actually got to business trying to solve some problems. So that's, we're as much about that process as not. And then we do have some salinity things I'm happy to talk about if you're interested that are actually very important to people in the Delta. I don't know how well that'll turn out. 
Phase two is um, similar, that goes up, th this was on the lower San Joaquin tributaries. Phase two is in a slightly different place. It is, um, it's at the scientific basis report stage. We did an awful lot of engagement. Some of you were very engaged, uh, extra comments on the draft. Uh, we're sending it out to peer review, blind peer review two shortly. We got ISB review, independent science board review on it as well, and we'll have a proposal uh, next summer. The framework of it is similar um, to that, that whole construct I talked about, but it also has a lot more in it to get inflows, outflows. Uh, you've got um, interior delta uh, flow issues, um, you know, similar to what the biological opinions have dealt with uh, cold water habitat. So there's just more in it, so watch that space. This is all, you know, you can buy popcorn to watch this. This is a pretty fraught series. And people feel very strongly on all sides, and some people do the pissing at each other. Sorry, can I, I I've said piss twice, that's probably bad. Um, you get it three times. I get it three times, thank you, three times I'm out. Um, uh, but there are also a lot of people trying really hard to figure out how to bridge divides and really get something uh, to happen here. So common components, I already talked about some of it. I probably talked about all of it. There you go, let me keep moving, I'll move faster again. Again, I talked about why to focus on flow. Uh, flow is essential, it's clearly not adequate now, and it helps with all the other uh, stressors, whether we're talking about predation or temperature, or, you know, you name it, you all know the details, so I won't explain it in, um, in detail, but fish definitely need more than flow, and I know they would say that. I know that. I'm not the Lorax, or whatever the fish Lorax is. Someone, we'll have to, someone has to write the fish Lorax book now. And there's just our time panel. All right. Don't forget this is my point here. But again, dialogue is the biggest problem. Okay, that's not that helpful. It's one way of putting it. I see that all the time. I understand the emotion of it. I get it. I think it, unfortunately, it produ produces a, an equal and opposite reaction versus attentive empathy, which is what we really want. This one that many of you saw recently, uh, here's another one, which I have to say has been bemoaned by many, many thoughtful farmers who are trying beneath the radar, outside the microphones, to actually make something happen on the ground and who speak about the need to preserve nature as something they do as farmers, but also as something they want to do for fish. Um, and I suspect we'll talk a little bit more about the rest of this in, uh, uh, in Q&A. Uh, we are in different, different times. This is also not the greatest way to talk about the need to save the fish. Uh, folks may see it in a graph. It's not particularly poetic or inspiring. It might be motivating for people who know, but it's not obvious to people who don't know. And we have to learn to talk about uh, the magic and the importance, um, not just the magic, magic might be dismissed, but uh, the possibility and the strength of being able not just to protect fish through restoration, but to do other things, the floodplain multiple benefit um, idea in a more poetic way. This was my life during the drought where folks jumped on one thing. It's an interesting thing where folks jumped and vilified it as if it were the whole problem. And it, I mean, these things have issues. They're definite issues depending on where they are. Uh, but it wasn't the drought issue. And of course, my favorite example is bottled water, which has all kinds of problems. And I've spent years in different jobs dealing with the scourge of, of too many bottles. But there are times when that water is important to a community that can't get water any other way to a kid to make sure they hydrate out on a hot day where you don't have a tap or a clean stream. And most importantly, it takes more water to make a beer. Should we ban beer? That always got the point across. Again. And then finally, there's a, a saying some of you know, um, in Chinese, I, I can actually say it, but I'm not going to, uh, that where they say it's a phrase like a chicken talking to a duck, which means where you're talking past each other, but you don't understand each other. And some of you were at the science conference heard me talking about my China story, but so let me tell you um, some others. I see this everywhere. This is the thing I see. Sometime back in the 80s, I was at a community meeting on uh, Biona Lagoon restoration. It's down in Los Angeles, right near where I live. I went because I lived in the community and people asked me to go because they knew I was a public interest lawyer. And I watched one set of participants 
talk about this beautiful wetland, this glorious ecosystem. They were practically crying, getting misty-eyed or crying about the importance of saving this wetland. The other folks got up and said, it's a stinking mud hole. Why are you going to take our money, disrupt our lives, do whatever for this stinking mud hole? And in response, the other people would just get more misty-eyed and more aggrieved. And I, t I told people I couldn't take this case for a variety of reasons, but I was happy to sit in the back and give them advice. And at the end, folks came up to me and said, OK, what do you think? I said, I think you kind of have to see it their way. And what you need to say before you talk about the wonders of nature and how great it is, you have to say, I know it looks like a stinking mud hole, but here's why there's beauty in this that perhaps we can't all see, and actually explain it versus expecting them to explain. A small thing, but a way to connect, either at the microphone or off the microphone, is to acknowledge a perception that, frankly, if someone doesn't come from your circle, they might not understand. Robert Greenfield in Servant Leadership has a concept of sort of verbal reinforcement that people uh, form self-congratulatory circles, and they talk to each other, and they have their own language, and they agree with each other. So they gird themselves then against the world because then the other people who don't agree with them must be stupid, venal, you know, or, or you know, pick your shot. And that ends up being the nature of the dialogue. So my, my point of this is that you have to figure out how to puncture that natural tendency as opposed to saying we're right, they're wrong. It's about empathy, it's about asking questions, it's about trying to figure out how to say it in a way people can understand. And I, I'm gonna run out of time, um, I probably already have, so I have myriad examples of this. Uh, it's smog check where I went, when I got to EPA, the state was at war with EPA on that, and I went and instead of bringing an entourage or just speaking at hearings, I visited every uh, legislator on both sides of the aisle who had anything to do on either of the transportation committees. And I had one particular, oh, I took it off. I was going to wear my ID card. I, 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 I took it off and I said to him, you know, Senator Russell, I know that you're being told that we're requiring this strict separation of test and maintenance. I won't get into the, the whatever. And he said, but I, but I said, but we're not really. We prefer it. I can tell you why, because of fraud and other things. But I can accept a deal from the state as long as it meets certain criteria. And he looked at me and he said, no, EPA is requiring, you know, insert, in his mind, big, fat, stupid thing, because that's what he would have expected EPA to do. And I said, no, really, I get that you're being told that, but that's not what we're proposing. You know, we, we like it better, I can tell you why, but we can do something else. And he says, no, EPA is requiring blah, blah, blah. So I. I, I remember some of these stories, and I pull my ID card on my bag, and I held it up to him with my picture on it and the big EPA logo. And I said, honestly, Senator, I swear to God, I work at EPA now, and we're not. And he looked at me and went, oh, well then. And that was the breakthrough in the negotiations. <laughs> and so I can do a minute. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting with two farmers who I have known for a very long time. They are my friends. We were having coffee and dessert. And we were talking about all the fractious discussions. And they both kept repeating to me what the state board was requiring <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the plan. And we were requiring unimpaired flow. It was so stupid. We were harsh, blah, blah, all this. And I went, no, really, we proposed this thing with the settlement encouragement and adaptive management and everything. And you all are doing a lot of these projects. You know, we need. And they just kept repeating what we were doing. And so what did I do? I got really pissed off. That's my third one. Third one. Yeah, oh, good. I, I, I got really mad at them because they were my friends. And, I, and they then made the worst mistake you can ever make. And, uh, and the women, maybe anybody in this room will appreciate it. One of them told me to calm down. <laughs> tell an angry woman to calm down. I just want to say that is a universal truth. If you did not know that before, you're welcome. <laughs> but afterwards, I thought, oh my god, I can't believe I reacted that way. That was not the right way to react. And um, so now I have to go meet with them again and ask them why. Uh, and so the, the point is, don't be chickens talking past ducks or thinking you speak duck when you don't. Okay. Or a 
salmon lover talking. I, I had a loving fish person and a friendly farmer. I just couldn't find better pictures. Um, I hear water users and editorial writers talk about environmental advocates as haters of agriculture, as people who don't value food. We in government are trying to dupe them, or we're just plain stupid. I think the headline in the Modesto B editorial, which invoked my name liberally, was conspiracy or incompetence, which is better. Um, <laughs> he would love that I talked about it, though. I'm sure he would love it. Don't tell him. Um, uh, they also talk about water diverted from them that doesn't appear to have helped fish, and they want to understand why they should give more. For some, it's rhetoric, and for others, it actually feels like the truth that they truly feel. I also hear a lot from those in agriculture who want to work on the basket of restoration and other actions that can truly help fish, but can't find willing partners or ears they feel from the environmental world. I hear fish advocates feel that no one cares or is listening or who have watched salmon stocks, let alone smelt, plummet, and other species plummet. They, and many of you, and many of us, are in a panic about it. What was that between panic and what? complacency? I'm closer to panic, I believe, at the moment. Um, uh, but all too often, I also hear them talk about numbers on a piece of paper or litigation and flow as a panacea, dismissing the other things that salmon need too like habitat, food, and evening the odds against predators. So each side has, thinks the other has all of the power, that is a truth, and that whichever the co-equal goals of ecological restoration or reliable water supply they care about is the one that's out of balance. The Delta folks sometimes feel left out of the whole equation altogether, even though they're also an integral part of it. Each side thinks the other knows everything their circle does and is choosing to dismiss it, and there are too few olive branches or efforts to bridge the divide or even translate language. There's beauty, magic, and something of intrinsic profound importance in restoring ecosystems as, we, as a society that we have degraded, and there's something truly wondrous and heavenly about the amazing life cycle of Salmonids. There's something important to us as humans, as I've said, in reconciling with the natural world through acts of restoration. But we don't communicate that very well as we talk numbers and papers and litigation threats. Similarly, people in agriculture feel it's so obvious that they're doing something equally wondrous and important to our humanity beyond the nourishment they create. But they can also lead with rhetoric and dismissal of the creatures we share this earth with. If we can see that we have competing goods, we don't have an instant solution, but we have the beginning of a conversation that can actually lead to better, a better and more productive way to make a difference that helps the ecosystem and people. And I also, as I've said, see people who are struggling to make these connections and to make it work. So if a salmon could talk in closing, oh, whew. If a salmon could talk in closing, what would they say? Well, they might settle the discussion and let us know how much flow and non-flow measures they want most and where, that'd be nice. I think they'd tell us to get off our high horses and talk to each other and get past the war of words and into action. I do definitely think they'd ask for more water, <laughs> maybe even 60% of what he's having. But they'd also ask for evening the odds against predators. They'd ask for food, cooler water, places to rest and grow and ready themselves for the next leg of their remarkable journey. A little help, please. Or they might be royally, oh, I can't say it now, royally mad and not deign, <laughs> not before, and not deign to speak to us. So we have to do our best, whether a scientist, an advocate, or someone taking action on the ground to communicate for them in a way that can be heard to bridge divides. But most important, we need to take action to do the things that we can do, which is what so many of you do every day, with inadequate resources, inadequate certainty of what others can do to help, and without certainty that everything you do will yield returns. And we do need to draw as many allies as possible into the work, not to fight the other guy, but to add their voices and energy and effort to help make a difference. We need to welcome and encourage the overtures, even as we continue to press for more resources or regulation or water. So I'm not without hope. And seeing all of you fills me with more. Oh, sorry. I was there yesterday. Patrick Coppell and Erica were there, but with uh, farmers, irrigation districts, and environmentalists trying to do some great things uh, on the uh, Tuolumne River. This I just share with you some Wendell Berry as I leave you. 
he really got the importance of both the land and ecosystem and farming. But I really like most, you cannot save the land apart from the people or the people apart from the land. And if you haven't read him, I recommend it. So most of all, I think the fish would say thank you to all of you for the remarkable work that you do through a combination of ingenuity, intelligence, heart, and plain old hard work. They'd say thank you for caring, and let's hope for more of you and more resources for more of you. And I wanted to say thank you, too, for all of that and for the inspiration to find new ways to make real progress on the ground with people to break through the rhetoric and get to the heart of things. Your work does more than help the fish. It bridges divides and it solves problems. And you know that sometimes that takes the, the uh, uh, thousand cups of tea we used to talk about at TPL. It helps us all be better. So thank you. And let's get more of that hopeful story out there. I look forward to working with you in the months ahead. Oh, question. We have time for one or two questions. Yeah, I took too long, sorry. That's OK. And yet you persisted. And yet I, per I have the hat. I have, I have the hat. All right, think of your questions during break. And um, she'll, uh, Felicia will be back up with us at the end. Folks, we have about 15 minutes to stretch your legs, get a drink of water, and be back in your seats.